Hey everyone, and welcome to our October live event with Nikki LaFoyle. She's back to answer all of your sewing questions. Thanks for being here, Nikki. Glad to be here. So just to remind anybody who's maybe a new viewer, if you have any sewing questions for about the next hour, we're going to be answering them and you can ask your questions to Nikki by putting those into the chat section that should be located somewhere on the screen around the video where you're watching this. So Halloween is just around the corner. Say you are invited to a last minute party and you have to throw together a costume. What do you make and why? Hmm, um, so Halloween costumes, so for something quick and easy, um, I think last time we we may have talked about this a little bit and I said a bumblebee, um, which is, you know, really easy, a, a yellow shirt and you can like tie black ribbons around yourself or do a fabric marker or if you have time to stitch your stripes on, that would be even better. But, you know, if you're in a pinch, you can tie some ribbons around yourself or something. Um, to make yourself a bumblebee. Um, and I mentioned for anyone who um, didn't hear it last time, the princess, the impromptu princess uh, costume, um, which you can really simplify any kind of princess, Disney princess dress by just taking the color, like Rapunzel has her purple dress. So if you have, uh, you can make a purple skirt if you have some purple fabric and um, just some take the basic details of her top um, or Snow White is a really easy one to do. She's got her her yellow skirt and her blue bodice. And then um, if you've got like a blue T-shirt or something, you can just stitch some red stripes on the sleeves because she's got those little red ribbon kind of things on her sleeves. So that's a really easy one. Um, my daughter actually went as Black Widow, the superhero from the Avengers. Um, and she had a little Halloween party a couple days ago. Um, so for her costume, I kind of cheated. I didn't really sew anything, but uh, it was a really quick crafting project. She actually helped me with it. Um, I just, I bought her a black long sleeve shirt. She wore black pants. And then Black Widow has these little bracelets on her wrist. So I rolled up construction paper and glued it. And I used my elastic thread. Actually, I still have lying around my elastic thread um, to stitch through those little paper tubes to make them into bracelets. Um, and then I made her a little elastic belt. I don't have any clips, but I had um, you know those little plastic clips just, you know, bag clips kind of. Um, and I stitched some elastic around the clip to make her a little belt and I glued the little hourglass Black Widow symbol. I cut it out of craft foam and then glued that onto her belt. And voila, she was Black Widow and that was a pretty quick and easy costume too. Perfect. So I wasn't following you necessarily with the princesses, but as soon as you said Black Widow, I knew what the costume was. You were was. on it. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone is unfamiliar with working with elastic thread, that's not something that you can just, you know, thread through your machine and sew like normal thread. So how do you use elastic thread? Elastic thread, um, since it does have, it's, it's basically elastic um, and it's really, really stretchy. What you have to do to use that if you want to use it in your machine is wind it on your bobbin. Um, so a lot of times people use elastic thread for shearing, which um, you sew uh, many subsequent rows of elastic thread and it gathers the fabric up. Um, so to wind this on your bobbin, um, you want to just hand wind it with like, a. you don't want to stretch it really tight, um, but you don't want it loose and falling off the bobbin either. Some machines, you might be able to wind it with the bobbin winder. Um, consult your machine manual. I don't know exactly how that would be done. I would always just wind it by hand. Um, and use a, in your needle, for your needle thread, just use a, an all-purpose thread. Um, and when you stitch to, to create shearing, to create gathering, um, when you stitch, you want to stitch a lot of lines, um, quarter inch ish apart. Um, and the more lines you stitch, the more it will gather up. So if you stitch one line, you're like, this isn't working because you have to stitch a lot of lines. Um, 
So yeah, that's the basics of Elastic Thread. Since I started talking about shearing, I want to finish uh, talking about shearing since nobody asked that, but <laughs> this is the direction. That's the most common thing you do with Elastic Thread. It is, it is. Um, so to finish that thought, um, when you're shearing, you want to use a lighter weight fabric as well. Um, a thicker, heavier weight fabric like uh, canvas or twill or wool isn't going to gather up very well. So when you use lighter weight things like um, lightweight cotton or something like that. Um, and one layer of fabric is always better than a double layer. It'll, it'll gather up better. Um, and... Perfect. All right, so that was, um, again, how to use elastic thread. I have a question, I guess, a follow-up question to how you were making your, your daughter's costume. You said you didn't actually have to sew anything, but I'm picturing with, you know, Black Widow. If you did actually have to sew, that would probably be um, a stretch as well as a vinyl fabric. So how would you work with something that is both stretch and vinyl fabric? Oh, and I think we might be having a bit of technical difficulties. Um, Nikki is frozen on our screen. Hopefully she'll pop back in here soon. Um, but if not, I guess I'm gonna take over asking and answering some questions for a bit. So again, if you have questions that you want to ask, you can do that by um, putting those into the chat screen if you're watching on the actual National Sewing Circle uh, page. If you're watching this on the YouTube comment section, you can put in questions uh, wherever you want to put those in um, and we will work our way through answering them. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about uh, sewing with a fabric that is, hey, Nikki's back. Hi. Hi. You lost my connection. No worries. So I, I was, uh, I'll ask the question again real quick. So I, you know, with your costume that you made for your daughter, you didn't have to necessarily so much, right? But if you were making a legit Black Widow costume, it's probably a mix of stretch and vinyl. So if you, you may maybe treat vinyl fabric one way and knit and stretch fabric another way, how do you work with one that's sort of a combination of both? Um, so when you say vinyl fabric, like that shiny looks like leather fabric. Okay. Right. Like a, like a faux like leather or like a, yeah. Yep. I'm just thinking like if you're right. walking on the costume fabric section of Joanne fabrics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so there are fabrics. Um, if you're sewing a legit Black Widow costume, um, so they make a lot of knit fabrics that have that sheen to them like leather so that it would be a knit but it would look like a faux leather kind of so you could use something like that if you were to combine a knit fabric with some other holiday type fabric that maybe didn't have a lot of stretch um i would so i would use a ballpoint needle so that's that's something that comes up when we're talking about uh, working with knit fabrics. Um, if you were working with a knit and uh, a woven fabric or like a non-woven fabric, like a faux leather, that's just kind of like a pressed fabric, um, always go with the, the, take the precautions that you would need for the more, um, the more delicate fabric or, you know, um, the harder to work with fabric. The harder, yes, the harder to work with fabric. So I would use a ballpoint needle, even if both fabrics weren't knit. Um, and I would stitch with the knit fabric facing the throat plate um, so that the feed dogs can grab the knit fabric and pull it along. Because otherwise your knit fabric may stretch out on top of your, your non-knit fabric if it's just pressed under the presser foot. Um, and then you'll end up with a lot of creeping and your seams won't match at the end and your knit fabric may get stretched out and you may get ripples. Um, but since we're talking about knit fabric and around Halloween, you know, knit fabrics and novelty fabrics are getting used a lot. Some other knit tips I have. Um, oh, I know what one of them is. <laughs> let me let me start from the top and go down the list. Um, 
use an all-purpose thread. Uh, don't use a 100% cotton thread because it's um, it doesn't have much give to it. A uh, all-purpose thread is a polyester core cotton wrapped thread. So the polyester core has a little bit little bit of give to it, um, whereas the cotton thread um, is kind of stiff, doesn't stretch at all, and knit fabrics you know will want to move with your body and stretch with your body. Um, a ballpoint needle, sometimes called a jersey needle or a stretch needle. They are all kind of synonymous. Um, the tip of the needle is just not a really sharp point. It's slightly rounded, still very sharp. You'll still poke yourself. Um, it'll still go through your finger. <laughs> um, it just, it won't um, slice through the fibers of the fabric. It'll more like nestle in between the knit construction of the fabric to avoid cutting fibers and possibly creating a run. Um, for knit fabrics, sometimes people encounter the fabrics getting stretched out or with those really slinky jersey knits, um, uh, the seams will creep um, and get uneven. So a walking foot is actually really good to use with knit fabrics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a walking foot, typically people think a walking foot for quilting because you have a lot of layers, you want them to stay together. So um, the walking foot is basically another set of feed dogs. You've got your feed dogs on the bottom uh, on your throat plate that kind of come up and pull the fabric along. And the walking foot is basically the same thing on the top. It, 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 it walks along the fabric and pulls it along at the same rate as the underlayer of fabric. Um, so that helps to keep your layers even, helps keep everything in place. Um, a roller foot is another one that could work in that scenario. So there's my roller foot. It's just basically got this little steam roller on the bottom. It's this metal roller that's got little grippy, little grippies on it. And that helps the fabric roll under the, the presser foot um, to keep everything even. Uh, the Teflon foot is another one that can be used in that scenario. Um, sometimes it's called a PTFE foot, but it's basically got that Teflon coating on the bottom, like your nonstick pans, to allow the fabric to slip right under the presser foot and not get stuck. This is also really good for faux leather or genuine leather fabrics, vinyl fabrics, um, oil cloth, anything that's got that slightly sticky feel to it. Uh, that might stick to the underside of your metal presser foot. This is a really good foot for that. Perfect. Um, I was going to throw in a couple of things. Uh, you know, I like to plug things that we have going on with National Sewing Circle. Because you mentioned sewing with uh, laminated cotton, oil cloth, vinyl, things like that, we currently have a gift giving campaign that we're doing. And so every week we're giving you sort of a fun project idea that is something that can be easily made as a gift. And so this week's project is a makeup bag, uh, which is done by one of our instructors, uh, Ellen March, did a bag uh, out of oilcloth. And so that's the, some of the tips that she she gives was using that foot. So if you want to um, make this project, there is links to it on Facebook, on the website, and it should come out in the emails as well. And they'll come out each Monday. So it'll be a fun new gift idea every Monday. Perfect. Sounds great. So I have a follow-up question to knit fabrics because you're talking about always using a ballpoint needle and things like that. And I want to talk about pins because I feel like we talk about needles a lot and we never talk about pins. So growing up, I've been digging through my pin cushion here. There was always just one kind of pin that I had in my pin cushion. They're always just little glass head pins that look like this. And I kind of assumed that all pins were equal, but they definitely are not, right? There are actual ballpoint pins and sharp pins and things like that. So do you have to use equivalent pins as well? You don't have to. Um, it is probably a good idea, though. You know, like a lot of things, I, part of the reason I like sewing so much is there are not a lot of hard and fast rules. You know, things are you know, you can take different ways to get to the same place. So um, yes, it's always a good idea to, if you're using a lighter weight fabric, use a lighter weight pin, like silk pins are great for that. They're, they're thinner, they're sharper, um, but like me, 
this is my pin cushion. I've got a million different kinds of pins in there. And when I need a pin, I'm just like blindly reaching for it. And like whatever pin I get is the pin that I use. Um, but yes, they make a, a lot of different kinds of pins. And if you if you can find a pin that would be better, better for the fabric you're using, that's always a good idea. Um, I'd say nine times out of 10, it's, it's fine to use just the generic, you know, glass head pins. But if you're using a fabric that is delicate, um, like a chiffon or, you know, a silk fabric that can be easily marred or easily snagged, absolutely get yourself some really good thin sharp pins like silk pins um, because that will just make it'll make it easier it'll make your end product turn out better um, so yeah they have a lot of cool stuff uh, things that you didn't you maybe didn't know you needed <laughs> if you walk through the aisles at Joanne <laughs> Yeah, that's always bad, but they have coupons, so it's okay. I was yeah. going to tell you, though, I'm not sure how well this will register, if you can even see the difference, but the one on the bottom is a really thick, big pin, and that's usually what I use for cotton, and the top mm -hmm. is an actual silk pin, which we're talking about. So you can just sort of see the difference in diameter and length and everything, so there's definitely, like I said, this would be kind of hard to get through, like a silk fabric, where these um, silk pins, which are my also uh, other favorite pin because I know there's a lot of controversy over whether or not to sew over your pins and <laughs> move them or not as you go. And I, I do generally re remove them, but sometimes I forget. And so if you are someone who forgets often, this is definitely the type of pin you want to use because it is, so it is super flexible. So you can see how easy it is to bend. So if you do accidentally hit it or nick it with the needle, odds are it's just going to bend out of place and then you can, you know, throw it away or try and straighten it back out or whatever. But it's less of a risk. Uh, damaging your machine than hitting like a big guy like this. Right. If you hit something like that, your needle might break and yeah, cause damage. So absolutely. Yeah. All right. We have a question that kind of came from a different uh, avenue. We had this question a lot on our quilting page because we're currently doing a quilting challenge and lots of questions about whether or not thread that you purchase at big box stores is lesser quality than those found at quilts or fabric stores. And in particular, a lot of questions about Coates and Clark thread, which is one that I've grown up sewing. For years, and when I think all-purpose thread, that is always what's on my machine is Coats and Clark. So, your opinions on that thread, and also on purchasing thread from a big box store. Um, as far as if there's a difference between getting it at a big box store versus a, a little quilting shop, I would say no, because odds are your quilting shop is getting the thread from the same manufacturers anyway. Um, so. You know, you've got your big names in thread, Guterman, Coates and Clark. Um, um, what was the other one, Ashley? Well, there's Sulky, Arafil. I use American and Eford Signature. American I, I, I collect thread a little yeah. bit sometimes, so. Yeah, um, yeah Sulky, American and Eford. Um, some of those big names, that's 90% of what you're going to see in all of your craft stores, whether they're bigger ones or independent ones. Um, and I, I've i used Sulky and Coates and Clark and Guterman. Um, and I don't really see much of a difference between them. Um, I just go with whatever has, uh, whatever matches my fabric best. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, um, Whatever matches your fabric best is kind of how I how I choose my fat my thread. Was that the question? Yeah, just your opinions on whether <laughs> thread versus the big box stores. We kind yeah. of went down a little route trail. That's okay. We did. <laughs> something that again uh, I mentioned we are doing a quilting challenge so if you are somebody who uh, does sewing but wants to dip their toes in the water of quilting you definitely should sign up for our mystery quilt challenge it's happening right now it started last week but you can join it anytime and make this fun quilt so a lot of questions come in about whether you should match your thread to your fabric in terms of piecing and quilting but is that the same when it comes to say garment construction and things like that do you always match your color or do you just use a neutral color that kind of goes with everything I try to match my color as much as I can, even with construction seams that you're not necessarily going to see because, um, 
you know, it might show through uh, in some, you know, in some way as you're pressing open the seam, some, you might be able to see it a little bit. Um, or if your fabric is thin, um, you might be able to see the color through, like if you're using a black thread on a, a thin type of fabric, um, even if it's a darker color, if it's kind of a gauzy fabric, you'll be able to see the color through it. So you want to match the color um, as much as you can. And then on your seams, like your if you're top stitching, um, that actually depends if you want to match or if you want a little pop of color. So on jeans, a lot of times their top stitching thread, they use a white thread to get that little pop of color and a little detailing. So it, it depends in that scenario, it depends on what you're going for and what your design ideas are for that. Perfect. All right, a question here. I've been working with some felt fabric and while stitching, I have pulled it and distorted it. Is there a way to fix it? Can I get it to go back to how it was? Um, so felt is very malleable. Um, I would say, I've, I've never done this myself, but I would say you might be able to, um, to kind of form it back together if you put some heat on it, like maybe some steam, you might be able to kind of form that back um, into shape unless it got stretched out and then if you put a seam in it while it was stretched out, I don't think you'd be able to really push that back together even with heat. Would you um, out the seam, maybe? If you took out the seam, you might be able to, yeah. Um, so felt, you know, like needle felting, people do their felting and they can create, they can form felt into any kind of shape they want. And that's obviously a different thing, but that's kind of how I think felt fabric might also work a little bit, depending on how much it's stretched out. You know, it's kind of a, a subjective thing. So how do you avoid that? happening in the first place um to avoid anything stretching out i would say refer back to those knit tips <laughs> um walking foot roller foot teflon foot um, to keep it from getting stretched out if your presser foot is able to be loosened so for some machines you can loosen the pressure of your presser foot consult your manual. Sometimes it's a little knob or a little screw on the top. You can loosen it so that the presser foot doesn't sit so hard down on the fabric on your throat plate. If you can just lift it up a tiny little bit. That might be all it needs to allow it to flow more smoothly and freely under the presser foot. So that could help too. Perfect. All right, next question here. How often should I be cleaning my machine? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that there's a real rule about it. Um, I would say it, it kind of also depends on what you're sewing. So if you're sewing things that have a lot of nap or a lot of, you know, dust and fluff that's getting flown off of it, uh, fleece, faux fur, felt, um, velvet, velveteen, things like that. You might want to clean it more often, like maybe every couple months. Um, I usually sew cotton fabrics, just quilting cottons, knits. Um, so I don't clean. I don't clean my machine as often as I probably should. Um, it's like probably a yearly thing for me. Um, I should probably. I should try to sync it up with like my dental cleanings. You know. <laughs> twice a month or twice a year. So every time I go to the dentist, I need to, uh, that can be my reminder to clean my sewing machine. Well, if 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 that's my reminder, then I'm still on par with not having <laughs> cleaned. <laughs> I honestly like, I'll, I'll end up, I was doing a video the other day where I was showing how to, to take throat plate off, change the throat plate. And when I took mm -hmm. it off, it was like, oh my goodness. There's, it really does accumulate under there. Yeah. Uh, faster than I think you think it does. Like it just, I mean, a tiny bit of lint and it's a tiny spot. So it kind of all gets stuck together. But so if somebody is uh, not cleaning their machine because they're intimidated or afraid of taking it apart and not being able to get it back together, how do you get over that fear? Um, it's it's super easy. And if, it, if you're worried about it, 
take pictures of everything as you're taking it apart so that you know how everything goes back together. Um, your machine manual might also have information on how to take it apart for cleaning. Um, but yeah, it's really easy. Just poke around in there. You're, you're not going to break anything. You know, you're not like throwing, no, you're not throwing things around. You're not going to break anything. Um, so to take your throat plate off, sometimes that's kind of hard because it's, it's a small area and they tighten up that screw so tight when it comes from the manufacturer, especially the first time you're trying, if you're trying to get that off, um, I use a nickel to unscrew the screw because it's it's low and you can get it in there. Sometimes a screwdriver doesn't fit in, you know, this two inches of space. Um, so you can use a nickel to get in there and really torque it to unscrew that screw for the first time. Um, and once you take your throat plate off, um, on mine, it doesn't really come apart much more than that. On the ones that have the, the bobbin, case that you insert and remove, you know, you remove that, that that should be familiar with, you know, changing out your bobbin. Um, and to clean inside of that area, they, a lot of machines come with a little brush and you can use that to brush out in there. Um, some people will say use a can of air to squirt in there. Uh, I don't really like doing that though because that can push the lint and dust and everything further in to spaces, uh, all little spaces in there that you don't want lint to be in. So I just use the brush and gently, you know, sweep it around um, and pull things out, little pieces of thread if there's anything like that in there. Um, another place that dust and lint can accumulate is in between your thread discs which is what you thread your um, your needle thread through. So as you're threading your, your discs, your tension discs, sorry. Tension discs are right in here. That's your first um, or your second point of contact when you're threading. Um, and that's those are the discs that move um, together and apart as you're changing the tension. So the higher the tension, the closer the discs are, and the more tension they're putting on the thread. And the less, the lighter the tension, the further apart they are, the less tension gets put on the thread. Um, so as your thread is going through those discs, um, it's a point of contact, point of tension. Some lint and dust can, uh, you know, puff off your thread um, as you're sewing. And after, you know, so many hours of sewing and all those little tiny bits of lint that come off of your thread, they, they accumulate. Um, so you wanna floss out between your tension discs. And you can do that with um, just a, a scrap piece of cotton fabric, fold it in half so it's a little bit thicker, open up your tension discs. Um, so put your tension at the highest number so they'll be wider apart and just kind of floss that fabric in between the, the tension discs um, and that will get out any of that lint and dust that's in there um, because that can create tension problems for you um, as you're sewing. Just having extra gunk in there adds more tension to your thread as you're sewing so it can, it can throw things out of whack. So I've never actually done that before. I think I might have to just try it later and just see if anything comes out of there. So yeah. you mentioned moving your uh, attention to the, the widest apart, but you'll also have to do something with your presser foot, correct? Um, with like, your presser in in what aspect? Um, like don't you, when you are like threading your needle, you always raise your presser foot because that like releases the tension disc. Yeah. So you have to do the same thing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. So um, yes, you're right. It will do that. <laughs> So I guess if you, if you don't know what we're talking about, if you've never um, realized that I think a lot of people just sort of, you know, if their needle breaks or their thread breaks while they're sewing, you know, they leave their presser foot down and they just go ahead and, and thread the needle. Um, and if you're trying to pull that thread through there, you'll realize like, it won't go mm -hmm. until you lift your presser foot up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Perfect. All right. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the different uh, presser feet options again and whether or not we had a question earlier about how you know whether a foot is going to be 
your machine? Is that going to go have a low shank or a high shank, or what does that even mean? Um, yes. So feet. I have a whole big bag of feet here. There's there's presser feet for every every occasion, um, and I don't use most of the feet in here. It's some of them are very specific for a very specific scenario that you might use once in a blue moon. Um, but I I bought these on Amazon just with my machine or anything. Um, it was just this pack of 36 feet and I wanted like four of them. Yeah. I think we bought four. <laughs> um, uh, but they can come in very, very handy and they can make your life a lot easier, especially when you're doing something like a rolled hem on a chiffon or something. Um, or the walking foot is absolutely awesome, especially if you're quilting a lot. Um, so, how so do you just buy a universal foot and, and hope that it fits your machine? Or how do you know it's gonna, gonna work with your specific brand? So, yes, you have to know if your machine has a low shank or not. Um, I think it's either low shank or high shank. Is that the other high yeah. shank? Um, so it will tell you in your manual. And if it doesn't, you can type it into your search bar, type in your machine um, manufacturer and model and the search term low shank. And if it doesn't come up on the manufacturer's website, um, probably in a sewing forum, someone has asked that question before and you can find answers. Um, they do make, I want to say they make adapters for a low shank foot to like a high shank, uh, machine. I think, don't quote me on that. seems like they should make something like that. Um, maybe, but I know that these, these feet are for a low shank machine and this machine is a high shank machine. So I bought these feet when I had my brother machine and they fit the brother and they don't. And now you can use them as props for all of our live events. And I love exactly. it. Exactly. Can you point out what the shank is since we've been talking about it and just in case the shank area. Um, yes. Yeah. So the shank is this thing that the, um, that your foot attaches to. I don't know how well you can see that. So where your foot attaches, this is the shank. Yep. Um, so yeah, some feet, so like if I take a foot from my bag, it doesn't fit. And this is actually because um, the shank is actually too wide on the machine for where it should attach here. So this is too narrow for it. Um, so if you're buying a set of feet online, you can check a lot of times they will say what, uh, manufacturers and models they're compatible with, or they might just say low shank or high shank. And you can tell if they will be compatible that way. Perfect. All right. Our next question here, uh, we have a question about washing fabrics and they want to know, I have already made a garment and I didn't pre-shrink fabric. I'm worried about it shrinking, but if I always wash it in cold water and dry on low to no heat, do I have to worry about shrinkage? Um, I think it would probably be fine if you do cold water and I would even hang it dry just to avoid that altogether. Um, so it, it'll probably be fine um, that way, probably, yeah. Um, I know, uh, I'm going somewhere, just give me a minute. <laughs> it takes time. Um, so when, uh, when fabrics come to you from the manufacturer and they're on the bolt in the fabric store, um, they come with, uh, they may have, you know, extra dyes or, um, or say, uh, pr like protective chemicals kind of, uh, it's called sizing, which doesn't make any sense. It's just the term. Um, so the sizing is the 
um, you know, the extra dye or the, the protective chemicals they put on it um, to keep it looking nice and crisp on the bolt uh, for however long it has to stay in the store until you buy it and bring it home. So there's all of that stuff on it that can affect the way it handles before it's washed the first time. So if the fabric feels really crisp and flat uh, before you wash it, um, it might not behave the same way after you wash it. Um, so as in terms of shrinkage, I think you'd probably be okay, but it might, it just might change the way that the garment uh, feels and wears after you wash that fabric for the first time. So I would, I always recommend washing fabric before you do anything to it, before you sew it, um, especially before you, you know, before you cut it. Um, but I've also, I've also skipped that step, you know. <laughs> I, I skipped that step a lot, uh, more often than not. So this actually was a question that came in on our quilting side, um, but they're talking about working with flannel, and they said that they don't pre-wash it because it has that sort of washed or worn look afterwards. So if you didn't pre-wash it, and this person was specifically making items to sell, do you feel like you need to say this has not been washed or shrinkage could occur or and somehow advertise that it has not been pre-washed? That is a really good question. Um, I, I would, I would want to put that out there so that the person who gets that item knows to be careful with it. Um, yeah, if anything that I, I very rarely have I made something and then went to sell it online, but anytime that I have, I've always put care instructions uh, in the listing um, because I want people to know what they're getting and know how to take care of it and be happy with the product when they get it. So I would give as much information as possible, but that's just me. Perfect. Speaking of care instructions, so I was trying, trying to look around my computer to see if they're within reach, but I just got some really cool labels from a company called Dutch Label Shop, and they actually make little like care labels that you can put into, say you're making a garment, and it will tell you how to wash it. So are, is a label something that you would put in your work, or have you ever labeled your garments or your projects before? Um, I never have, but I always wanted to. That seems like such a professional little touch, you know, and it's um, it's just a, a cute little extra step that, uh, I just, I've never, I've never done. I don't know if it's, uh, I guess I, I don't really make things to sell. So if I was going to make that like my business, I would absolutely do labels because I think that's adorable. Um, so yeah, what, what company did those come from? So they came from Dutch Label Shop, and I'm gonna look harder to find them. There will be a video on <laughs> on National Sewing Circle uh, soon where we actually show um, what they look like and how they're made. They're um, nice woven labels, so you, and you can put whatever you want on them. So I had some that were made that said "handmade with love." Um, for I specifically was making some baby quilts and baby blankets, and I didn't necessarily I don't know the baby, you know, have a personal yet so like it just I wanted a generic tag um, and then you can put your name on them so I have some that say handmade by Ashley because I like to uh, label all of my husband's clothes that I make so everybody mm -hmm. knows um, and so those are you can get them in iron on or sew it so they're just um, super nice. I know they're around here somewhere I just this is the only clean area of my sewing room behind me so that's why I can't <laughs> find them in front of me. But um, again, there will be that video uh, up on uh, National Sewing Circle so you can see that. And you mentioned that it would be something that you would use if you made that your business, but you can totally have them. And even if you're not, you know, as a business, even if you're just making say gifts for people, you can totally have them. Yeah, that would be a, an awesome thing for little gifts. That's such a, a cute, um, just heartfelt, thing that just takes it that that extra step I think it's really cute yes um speaking of those labels since they are iron on and sew in 
when you are ironing on something, so when they specifically just the thought of it, because their directions always say to use a press cloth or some sort of protective sheet. And in all of my years of sewing and using iron on interfacing and things like that, I don't think I ever used a press cloth on anything. So yeah. when, when is it really important and why do you actually need a press cloth? Um, the press cloth is, I think I've used a press cloth mostly just to protect my iron. So you can, um, you know, when you're putting interfacing on, you do it generally blue side down. But um, there have been occasions where I did it glue side up. I don't remember why, but um, I've, I've only used a press cloth to protect my iron or maybe it was I was ironing something that um, may might stick like a like a full leather or something because you can iron full leather very um, gently, yeah. low mm -hmm. um, and I was concerned about it melting onto my iron or something so I used a press press cloth um, to protect my iron but in situations like that where you're you don't want the direct heat of the iron to come in contact with the fabric um, press cloth is a good idea. Perfect. I have a Teflon press sheet that um, my 18 month old just likes to crinkle. And so that's yeah. what we use it for. <laughs> that's a good, you yeah. know. Perfect. Perfect. So if you didn't use a press cloth and you've got something on your iron, how do you clean your iron? Um, I think they make a product that will clean the sole plate of your iron. I've never used something like that. I just, I know that they make it. Uh, if I got something on my iron, I'd probably I'd wait for it to cool and I would try like a goo gone or something if it was something really sticky um, or, you know, soap and water. Just wait. Make sure you wait until it's cooled off first. <laughs> Good tip. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. All right. I'm looking. If, if anyone has any questions out there, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. So if you have any additional questions that you want to um, ask to Nikki, go ahead and put those into the chat section and we will work on uh, answering the rest of those. Since I've been frantically looking around my table in front of me and have yet to find my labels, I have over here all of my um, adhesives and things that I, I use, which are an alternative to sewing, which back to our very first uh, topic where we're talking about Halloween costumes. If you have to do a no sew variety, using an adhesive or a glue is, is generally something that is easily usable. Um, what are your favorite kinds and what would you prefer to use one over the other? Um, yeah, they have a whole bunch of different varieties of glue. Um, I generally go for Aileen's, A-L-E-E-L-E. -E -E. That's the one. The gold bottle, I have a bottle of that just good old original tacky glue. Um, that is a good all purpose craft glue. Um, they make glue for, um, you know, those no sew hems that you just put a line of glue and turn up your hem. Um, there's glues for adding rhinestones onto fabric. There's, you know, all kinds of different glues. Um, I like Aileen's. They're making their bottles now so that they have the nozzle down and the cap on the nozzle so that it sits like that. I, I like that. You know, that's the kind of thing that earns my the pin every time and get my yeah. so that, how do you know if it's going to be um permanent or not? Just because I'm looking at this one definitely says temporary for basting, but this one doesn't say anything at all. So if I'm gonna pick a glue, how do I know that it's going to survive, say going through the wash or something like if I'm gonna use it on a hem? Um, if it's temporary, generally the bottle will make that well known. So always read all the instructions on the bottle. Um, if it doesn't say temporary, I would assume that it is permanent. Um, but if you want to make sure that it's going to stay perfect through repeated washing, go with something super hardcore, like make sure it says on the bottle, permanent will you know, will stand up to washing. Uh, but you also want to make sure that if you're using it for a hem on fabric, you want it to not be like really stiff too. So they make those fabric glues that are permanent, that are specifically for hemming or 
you know, garment, uh, gluing garment construction type things. Um, so there, there's a glue for that. Whatever you want, there's a glue for that. Uh, if they don't have it at uh, your, your craft store, go on Amazon and they will definitely have it. Absolutely. And because I haven't plugged enough of our videos on National Sewing Circle yet tonight, um, we actually have an instructor who uses glue more than any other person I've ever seen. <laughs> Tara Rex uses it all the time. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> she was the first person I've ever seen to use. They actually make a fabric glue stick. And the first time I watched mm -hmm. her do it, I really thought she was just using, you know, little kids like glue stick, but it actually is meant for fabric and it is super handy and you can use it. Um, she was using it, I think, for some basting, um, you know, just temporarily hold things in place instead of using pins. But yeah, there's definitely a glue for everything out there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. If you had your choice between, say we're going to do a hem, using a glue or have you ever used a hem tape, a fusible hem tape? I have. Um, pick and why? I would pick the fusible hem tape. Um, and I don't know why. Maybe it's because that's, you know, they taught me to use that in college. and uh, I think adhes using adhesives for these things is a generally new concept. Um, maybe it's because society in general is, you know, getting, you know, wanting quick fixes or whatever. Maybe that's a little too high concept, but um, I just, I feel like I can really see and I, I can see it and I can feel it working and glue just seems even if it says it's permanent for something like a hem it just it doesn't seem like as permanent as it should be like that fusible hem tape is a physical thing that's going in there and i know that it's going to hold and maybe it's just because i i haven't used glues for that um scenario very much and so i don't necessarily trust it um but See, it's more of an, an immediate satisfaction as soon as that fusible hem tape cools it is permanent you don't really have to wait for glue to dry so um since since you went to school for sewing you know all the ins and outs of things um when you're doing something like a blind hem why why is that sewn in place as opposed to just using a fusible hem tape um so the blind hem it's you can't, you can hardly see it on the right side. And uh, fusible hem tape, you get the same end result looking at it from the outside. It looks the same. So, why would you do a blind hem versus fusible hem tape? The blind hem is tricky, you know, it, it can be tricky or intimidating to do until you learn how to do it. Uh, fusible hem tape is easy and quick. Um, but the blind hem, is um you know the threads are stitched right in to the fabric of it you know it's not coming undone and um the thread is it'll move with the fabric um it'll wash with the fabric it's not going to come unstuck um and you're and if you grow an inch and you need to let out that hem you can exactly good point <laughs> Yeah, and and the uh, the the stitched hem um, will just it'll be stronger, longer lasting, and I feel like it'll move better with the garment, especially if you're using a fabric that is lighter weight and flowy and kind of slinky. A fusible hem tape, um, you might be able to see from the right side. It might add a little bit of stiffness to the fabric that you may not necessarily want. So um, there's a there's a time and a place for uh, fusible hem tape and glue, and there's a time and a place for sewing. Absolutely. And if you want to learn how to do the blind hem, uh, or hair pants or something, we do have a video. I believe Aurora, our instructor Aurora, is the one that shows how to do that, um, and makes it really quick and easy to see how to just fold the fabric correctly before stitching, because that's really like the main. Uh, part is to fold it uh, mm -hmm. first. And then we've been talking a lot about presser feet. There are feet that can help with doing the uh, blind hem stitch. They have a little fin or a little guide on them that you can run 
on that. Hold it into your fabric um, and make it much easier to line it up and make sure that those stitches are going um, where you want them to. And I have a feeling you're looking for it right now. I am. That's why. My, am I making enough noise? <laughs> I, think so. I think I can hear you rummaging through the bag. <laughs> yes, the blind template has it has a little flange in the middle that you align with the uh, the fold of the fabric. It's so there it is. There's the the that flange in the middle. You just line it up with the fold of the fabric, zip it right along, and makes it quick and easy. Yes. And if you're a quilter and you are thinking about, hey, that foot looks a little familiar to one I might have. It's also, uh, you can use sort of like a stitch in the ditch foot is one that you can also sort of use um, instead of, or if you have that one also, it also has a little flange and makes it easier to run along the edge. Um, since we're talking about hems, how do you decide what hem to use on a specific garment? I'm saying growing up, my mom is the one that taught me how to sew. Um, and I'm pretty sure that for the first 20 years of my sewing, I only ever did a double fold half inch. That's the only hem I ever did. So when do you maybe do a different hem or a more delicate hem or how do you decide what to use? Um, yeah, that's 90% of the time. That's what I always use. Just that standard good old double fold hem. Um, that's, that's a good all purpose hem. But if you're doing something like you mentioned a little more delicate, so you're sewing a, a lightweight skirt or dress or something that's really flowy and you want a hem that will flow with the fabric um, because a double fold, you get some, you know, you get some thickness, maybe some stiffness. And if you want something a little more flowy, um, a rolled hem is a nice, it's basically, it's basically a double fold hem just super, super duper narrow. Mm -hmm. And they have a foot for that. Um, depending on the size of the rolled hem that you're doing, they make different sizes of rolled hem feet. Um, and it's got this little curly cue kind of seashell looking thing in there. Um, so you, you kind of work your the edge of your fabric into this little roll. And once you get it started, I usually, I double fold and press the first couple of inches to get it started. Or you can stitch a basting line to help give yourself a, a line to fold your fabric on. Um, and once you get it started kind of rolling in there, it'll just kind of go right along and you just, um, you know, make sure with your fingers as it's going through that it stays folded. Um, but that's a really narrow one. I have one that's less, less or more narrow maybe. So you can see the difference between these two. Mm -hmm. um, you, you did a video on the site, I think, where this is in, in part of something else you were showing. Um, we have that one available. And then we also have one. Beth Bradley shows how to do a narrow hem on a lightweight fabric, but I can't entirely remember if she actually used that foot or not, or she shows how to uh, run a basting stitch and use that as your fold line and then fold it up. So you, if you don't have this awesome box of presser bead that we both bought on Amazon, which you can get as well, um, then there is a way to do it sort of without the um, specialty requirements. Yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You can do it without the, the specialty foot too. Um, so other types of hems. Um, I'm specifically thinking of like sew-in hem tape as well, since we talked about usable hem tape and it was something that I don't think I was even really aware that was a, a thing until um, my mom used it on the dress she made at my wedding to, to do a hem and I didn't even know. So what is it? Um, so hem tape, if, if we're talking about the same thing, it's just a, like a twill tape basically that you stitch to the raw edge of your fabric and then you stitch the opposite edge of the tape to the garment. Um, and I, the application that I, I think of when I think of that is a thicker fabric, like wool fabric or something so that 
like a double fold wouldn't really work on because it would get too thick and bulky. Um, so you're basically laying the, the tool tape over the raw edge, um, or you can, you know, lay it over the raw edge and stitch it to that edge and then stitch the opposite edge to the tape. So, so there's no, there's no folding of the fabric other than that, you know, that hemline fold. So it's good for bulk, for thicker, bulky fabrics. Um, it keeps everything laying nice and flat and smooth. Perfect. That is like the opposite thing I thought of when I <laughs> said like when to use it. And it's, and it's great because it works for both applications. But I think of I would use that when say I, I, have, I made a skirt and I want to hem it, but I don't want to fold up too much and make it shorter than I intended. Uh, That's sort of the way to cheat and have a little bit of extra right yeah. Okay. yeah exactly yep and if you're if you want to let out a skirt or something and you only have so much to work with that's a good way to eke out a little bit more length perfect all right so we have just a, a couple more minutes left so i got to recap a couple of the things that we've got going on on both national sewing circle and our sister site uh, national culture circle again i mentioned earlier when we were talking about working with laminated cotton and oil cloth things like that um we have a gift giving campaign going on right now so Every week for the next now five weeks on Mondays, we're going to announce uh, just a fun new project. It's going to be on the site that even if you're not a member, it will be available for free. So you can uh, download anything you need to go along with that project. Um, and then the other thing is if you want to dip your toes in the water of quilting, you should sign up for our mystery quilt challenge. Uh, and that is going on right now. You can do that on National Culture Circle or on the Facebook page as well. So we have maybe one more question here. So I'm going to say, what is your number one tip for new sewers? Oh boy, that's a tough one to boil it down. Number one new tip, number one tip for new sewers. Um, um, let's see, I would say um, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, perfect. Yep, the good old, that's, that's always in the back of my head, even though I'm a seasoned sewer, uh, measure twice, cut once, because you can't take that cut back once yep. you make it. <laughs> I agree. But if you only shift off just a little bit too much, go ahead and use that hem tape like we just mentioned. <laughs> A little bit perfect so definitely remember that awesome i want to thank you for being here to answer all of everyone's questions um we are going to be taking a little break from you sadly while you travel to some awesome places the next couple months but we're going to have a sort of nikki stand in for a bit and then we'll see you back uh the first of the year yep i'll be back in january i will miss you ashley and i will miss talking with everybody but you guys are going to be in good hands with ashley and um you'll still be learning a lot Absolutely. Thank you, Ben, for answering all our questions. And thank you all for watching. I hope you have a good night. Good night.